Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. In today's video, we're exploring what the difference is between the 16 personalities and your personal development, right? Because when we study the 16 personalities, it's easy to assume that every single thing that we see in other people and in their behavior is a result of their personality. We might say, I don't like these personality types. I think they are dumb and superficial. I don't like those personality types. They're too emotional, too irrational, you know. I don't like these personality types. They're too loud, right? And here, a lot of the time, you know, it's hard to say what it is that is just personality type preference and what is development, right? Because what happens when people develop is most people that feel more developed, that have reached a higher level of maturity, a higher age, you know, that have lived more, been more seasoned, have more relationships, had more deep experiences, worked harder, you know, uh, studied more, you know, these people tend to feel that they are more balanced as people, right? So typically, what ends up happening is, you know, you start out with a personality type and often nowadays when I ask people about their personality and try to help them find out what their personality is, I tend to start with their childhood and upbringing, like what their early years looked like, what their first interests and hobbies were, what kind of things they were most drawn to, what the, their biggest weaknesses were when they grew up, what they found most difficult, what subjects they struggled with in school, what extracurriculars they had, you know, like I tend to focus on these things and what they enjoyed about them and why they were drawn to that. And, what things they liked about it, right? And I work through these specific things because I nowadays I tend to see personality as, you know, the root, you know, where you started out, your starting point, like the first platform, right? Uh, <laughs> but that puts us in a bit of a conundrum because then the question is, do we eventually lose our personality? Do we all become just bland, blasé, you know, 50-50 people, right? Or is there something very different that happens? What I've found is, well, certainly development can look at that. Me definitely age can make us mellow out, right? It can make us lose our edge, lose our passion, lose our emotion, lose your, our like more sharp logic and wit, make us lose our interest and enthusiasm for abstract topics, you know, to become more rounded and more like everyone else, right? But there is another form of development, which I think is more, you know, learning to do both. And when I think about learning to do both, you know, like it's different from mellowing out because when you mellow out, what ends up happening is you go more to the middle, right? So your extreme higher stats go down and your lower stats go up. Uh, but what ends up happening when the case of development is, you know, this dichotomy is broken into two, meaning you can be both very extroverted and very introverted. And so what I can see then is you get these people that are capable of being very confident and very outgoing but also people that are very individualistic and very much in touch with their own identity and very good at taking space for themselves and time for themselves to engage and explore their own thoughts, to think critically about things, to introspect and to remember who they are, right? So what I'm talking about when I talk about development is not necessarily that aspect of mellowing out, but rather the aspect of, you know, breaking the dichotomies in two and learning to remove these kinds of oppositional attitudes and ideas that we tend to have early on in our age, right? Because especially in the case of trauma and bad experiences, it's very easy to develop this antagonistic psyche, right? Where you have the dominant function in the top and the lead and the inferior in the bottom and the dominant has to assert its authority and conquer the inferior, get rid of it, throw it away, right? And that's how a lot of people tend to look at it, right? So they see their goal to free themselves from the influence of their inferior function with the idea that, you know, if I can just get rid of it, I'll be happy. I'll be great. Everything will be awesome. Everything will work out. Not realizing that, you know, their dominant and their inferior are two sides of the same code depending on each other's living in actually a symbiosis, right? Because if we think about it as an ecosystem, the cognitive functions can be described as an ecosystem. Every single part of your consciousness Every one, each and one of your cognitive functions work together to help you think and achieve knowledge, gnosis, consciousness, and a higher level of thinking, right? But when you have this antagonistic way of thinking about it, you miss that opportunity, right? Because now every single experience that you have is the result of this tension between good and evil and bad and right and wrong, right? So now suddenly everything that, you know, your opposite does is coded in this like negative way as, you know, how you shouldn't be. <laughs> and everything that uh, you do through your dominant function is how a person should live, right? 
especially in the case when people have be like me syndrome, right? Because people can have be like me syndrome or be like them syndrome, right? Because there are certainly people that also want to, you know, be like their opposite, right? People that have this envy, this tendency to feel like, you know, I wish I was like my inferior function. I wish I had the capacities of my inferior function, you know? Everyone with my inferior function seems to be so happy and seems to do so well, you know, but everyone with my dominant function seems to be... Well, regardless of whether you envy the dominant or the inferior function, it's still an antagonistic relationship because you're still working from the idea that one is good and one is bad. One is right and one is wrong, right? So ultimately, how do we learn to integrate the two and bring them together, right? Because Carl Jung believed the goal of individuation must be to learn to bring these opposites together so that we can form and reach a holistic state of being, right? So to be individuated to him was to be able to not just differentiate between and distinguish between and recognize the differences between these two functions and processes and ways of being and ways of life, but to learn to wield both of them together, right? So many of the early pictures of the ascended person was a, pers was a drawing of a person that holded their heart in one hand, you know, and their sword in the other hand, representing, you know, being in touch with your feelings, but also with logic and also with action and also with your intuition and the skies above and with the ground and the earth below you, right? So a lot of the time it was bringing things together and finding your own way to merge these natures and ideas into your own weird way of existing, right? Because it ultimately is going to be always your way, right? Because even if you learn to bring all these things together, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be the same like every single other person around you. No, being individuated means having this unique way of living and experiencing the world. And because you are unique, because you have your own DNA, your own way of development, your own thought processes, right? What's gonna end up happening is you're gonna have your own intuition, your own feeling, your own thinking, your own sensation. And all those things are gonna be uniquely you. And no matter which one you use, that's gonna be uniquely you, which means that you end up being this unique amalgamation of all these different processes and thoughts and ideas and ways of making decisions. And of course, that's just going to continue to evolve, right? Because uh, the better you're able to integrate this, well, the more often you're going to experience flow or the state of optimal experience, the way of, you know, seeing uh, everything happen the way you want it to, to be optimally connected to yourself, to use all parts of your mind together in a balanced way to make balanced decisions based on and informed by all processes with intuition, sensing, thinking, and feeling, right? Both the introverted and extroverted version of it. Now, one question could be, how do you illustrate the difference between typological models where we have different personalities and what people do as a result of their different unique personality and how can we compare it to the idea of a vertical model or development, right? Well, what you can think of it as is, well, first of all, it can be, you know, the starting point, right, and the bottom. So typology is the bottom of development, right? So it's where people start out, right? So you can see it as, you know, they can start growing from here or here or here or here or here, right? So they might have one skill point in their first cognitive function, right? And then from there, they might branch out and add on other functions. They can go in two ways here. They can either go deeper into that specific function gaining more and more expertise over it and getting better at it and getting more well-rounded in it. Or they can start branching out into other functions, right? Suddenly, not just having skill in one function, but in multiple, right? So Carl Jung didn't always work from the idea that everyone had two developed functions. Arguably, he worked from the idea that people started out with one developed function and maybe then after that two and perhaps after that three, right? So he would work from the idea that people could bring these functions into consciousness, right? So often when he was giving people therapy, what he did was he sat with them and he you know, presented them with different archetypes and images and perhaps they did dream readings and you know, through the dreams they encountered different archetypes and perhaps this patient had like different experiences with these archetypes. Perhaps they didn't like some of them. Perhaps they didn't like archetypes representing TE or extroverted thinking or perhaps they didn't like archetypes representing introverted feeling, right? And so when that happens, right, Jung will engage in basically a form of exposure therapy, right? So 
Young will be helping you get more familiar with this archetype, to see its positives, to develop a more healthy relationship to it, to learn to bring it into consciousness. Because we can assume, like, most people are born in chaos, right? When we're born, we don't have any model to understand and differentiate our reality or experience. We have experiences, yes, but we can't explain what these experiences are. So we're born in chaos, but gradually as we develop, we start forming systems and games and tools, you know, and these things, they become our model of reality and they help us organize information. So now whenever we listen or hear new things, those things are put in those like ideas and definitions and filtered through your language, grammatical structure, thought processes, like uh, beliefs, ideologies, values, and things like that, right? So you're starting to add things on here, right? And uh, you can have them people that have one archetype that they've started to go really deep into, right? Then they might have, in this case, a negative relationship to every other archetype. They might struggle with all of the other cognitive functions beside their own dominant, right? Feeling like everyone else is shallow, everyone else is stupid, everyone else is superficial, everyone else is boring, right? Except me, I'm the only one that has things figured out. Like my function is the only important one, the only one we should listen to, the only one we should make decisions by, the only one that we should consider, and everything else is bad and wrong and moral, right? And that can happen very easily to a person, right? Especially early on in life, right? We start thinking that's how you're supposed to be. Now the goal then to young would be start showing positives of other ways of functioning or thinking. Start helping people understand ways other people's ways of life can be helpful or positive to you. Start noticing things that your partner or friends do that can be helpful or beneficial to your life. Start thinking about and understanding how you can relate to other people's experiences and thoughts to empathize with other people. Now, you could simplify it and say that people can be different in that some people only have two functions developed or one function developed, while others have four functions developed, while others have six functions developed, perhaps, or some, like the sages and gurus, like uh, the brilliant people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, the polymaths, the Renaissance people that, you know, have reached a higher level of being, a higher level of consciousness, might have as many as eight. And so, what you might be asking yourself when you're studying a person, a friend or family member, you notice conflicting behavior, right? What you might want to observe is how many functions does this person seem to be consciously using in their life, right? For example, do they seem to have the capacity to switch between, for example, a friendly and kind style to a disagreeable or logical one? Or do they stay in the friendly and kind and agreeable style, right? All the time, right? Because if a person is capable of switching between the two, not just due to stress or lashing out or burnout, right? But in a healthy way, if a person can, in a healthy way, in a positive way, wield both the nature of kindness, giving and feeling, or on the other hand, to deal with and to wield and to consciously engage in critical thinking, logical discussions and dissections and argumentation in a way that is helpful and positive and constructive for other people, right? If a person is capable of doing, doing both of these things at once, you can say that this person has been able to integrate both feeling and thinking archetypes into their psyche, meaning it becomes like scripts that you can pull on or use in any given moment. So suddenly you get these people that, you know, when they're talking to one person, they can be very kind, very considerate, very empathetic. And when they're talking with another person, they can be tough, they can be like critical, they can ask hard questions, they can, you know, challenge them, they can you know, put the person in a spot where, you know, they're forced to evaluate and examine their own ideas and to explain their own thought process and to evaluate and think how they can improve their own behavior, right? So, and that's to me like uh, what development looks like when a person has not just consciousness of these two things, because a lot of time it can be that you switch into these things, but you don't, you don't even notice consciously that you do it, right? You think you're always nice, and uh, then you do things and other people feel, whoa, whoa, that's kind of rude or that's kind of critical. That's, that's a very harsh thing to say, right? <laughs> and you don't even notice that you're doing it, right? Because you're stressed and you're tired and you're not paying attention to yourself or to what you're doing, or you haven't even recognized it yet in yourself. Like this can be something new that you've started doing lately. And, you know, of course, the nature of like, is it positive or negative, right? So, am I able to use this function to make improvements in my own life? 
and in the lives of other people, right? Because if it's negatively influenced, it's used as a way of lashing out, of hurting other people, or of self-sabotage, or of hurting yourself, right? That's not a sign of development. Well, it could be that you're starting to get to know the function and you're just making a terrible effort at it, right? Uh, but it's not a sign of development to the level of where it feels like this is a conscious function that I use positively in my life. Now, a lot of models of typology are models of development. Some models, like BB's model, which I'm very critical of, argue that you know, the eighth function will always be a demon and the sixth function will always have the cynics or witch role or that the seventh function will always have you know, the trickster role, right? But to me, you know, the connotations and associations you have to each function says a lot about your development, right? So often when we paint the function in a negative light, when we a painter represented as a demon or a hag or a witch or something bad, you know, that's often a sign that we are repressing something, right? We're critical of something, we're struggling with something, we're not in touch with something. And the danger is if we use typology as a model of development, arguing that some, you know, you'll always have this function this developed, and you'll always use this function this much and to that degree, it becomes very, very static because now um, typology is not just a model of personality, but it's also a model of development, which means that now you're not even allowed to climb the ladder or to improve yourself, to better yourself or to, you know, reach a happier, more fulfilling way of living. Now you're doomed to be and to feel the way you do at the moment and you'll always feel that way and it will always be because of your personal type and because of who you are and not because of any effort of your own and not because of any experience that you've had and not because of traumas in the past but just because of your genetic personality code, right? Now the way I think about it is use typology and personality psychology and the 16 personalities to identify strengths and weaknesses that you currently have but assume that you can learn to think like any personality and that you can learn to express and get in touch with these sides in yourself. Approach and think about, you know, what your bordering strengths and skills are. Like if you work from the skill tree approach, right? You develop these skills, you have these that you have really not developed yet, that are far in the distance, and you have these that are quite close by, neighboring you. So now the step might be, how do I include these into myself, right? Because it's so much easier to integrate the auxiliary or the tertiary into your life than it is to in integrate the inferior into your life, right? And it's so much, much, much easier to develop and work from your current skills and abilities, right? There's even something to be said about what happens when we go really deep into a specific cognitive function, right? Because if you're dealing with an INFJ that has spent one skill point on introverted intuition, who is in the beginning of their development, sure, it's their only function, it's the only thing that they have dominant conscious control over, yes, but it's not very strong yet, right? And compare it to somebody that spent 20 skill points into that, right? So they've gotten quite good at it. They've started to really get really skilled at it. Well, what ends up happening is you can use NI in unexpected ways and in unexpected situations. Suddenly you can use NI in ways which might resemble, for example, FI or TE. And it can come from the result of, you know, getting more conscious of it and getting better at it and understanding its rules better, but also learning to reuse your skills in unexpected areas, right? So, Similarly, in cognitive development, you know, you can have a person that has really developed their left part of their brain while their right is completely not there, right? So the right can be completely full of cobwebs and spiderweb, while the left one is super active, like a, you know, fast motorway, autobahn, right? It's full of files and cars and everything happening in a million seconds per hour, like. <laughs> uh, now... That can be the case, but this person might have developed their left brain to do typically right brain tasks. And they might have found ways to be very creative in their use of the left brain in unexpected ways. So that can happen too, right? So your use of NI can lead to a higher capacity to use FI or NE or FE or TE or some other functions, depending on you know, how you learn to use it and how versatile you get in it, right? There's experts that have spent a hundred years studying mushrooms and, you know, if you have them learn about something like, uh, you know, uh, the system of a flower, they might be able to see and draw comparisons and say, hey, actually there are certain aspects of the flowers that I'm learning about right now 
that are similar to the mushrooms that I've been studying for a very long time. And so they might be smarter and more effective at learning about this topic simply because of their expertise in mushrooms, right? And so similarly, your expertise in introverted intuition might lead to a heightened capacity to get stronger in other forms of cognitive reasoning or cognitive functions. Ultimately, I tend to look at cognitive functions as fluid intelligence rather than crystallized. And what I mean with this is, well, fluid intelligences, they boost learning, decision-making, and information gathering, right? So they allow you to make decisions faster, to get new information, to understand things more quickly, to comprehend the information better, right? But they're not the information itself, right? So uh, there is no cognitive function which is biology, knowledge of biology. There are multiple cognitive functions that each can learn about biology and can master biology. And they can do it in different ways. So they're like learning styles, learning functions, right? So cognitive functions represent the process of getting information, but not the information itself, right? So when we're developing our functions, what we're developing is a higher capacity to learn, a higher capacity to make decisions, a higher capacity to make and effectively manage our emotions and to figure out how to solve problems when presented with them. Now, that's different from crystallized knowledge or intelligence, right? So when we're talking about crystallized intelligence, what we're talking about is like a person might have learned everything about the TV show Friends. And so, you know, if you ask them a question about Friends, they don't need to use their cognitive functions to answer that question. And they'll just give you the answer because they have the answer. It's stored in their brain. They memorized it, right? So crystallized knowledge and information, you know, is very different from cognitive reasoning. And so I'm starting to develop these tests to measure cognitive function development. And I'm realizing, you know, to test people's cognitive function development, I have to avoid asking them trivia questions, you know, which they might have already thought of the answer to. I have to ask them questions that make them think. To see their cognitive function at work, I have to put them in a situation where they have to actively use their brain, not just to remember something and share the information they've gotten, but to figure out and think on their feet to solve it, right? So get them out of their planning and into a position of chaos, where, which requires conscious energy and attention to you know, organize and understand and interpret and decode and make a decision. So when we're talking about a person that's very cognitively developed, we're not talking about a person that necessarily is an expert or knows a lot about the subject. We're talking about a person that has the capacity to become an expert very quickly. And so is the case when we're talking about gifted people, because, you know, there's kids growing up that are gifted, highly intelligent, with a higher level of fluid IQ. And what we see is, you know, by every definition of their word, they're still kids, which means that they still function like kids, think like kids, have the experiences of kids. but the difference being that they learn really fast. They figure things out faster than normal. They study easier. They, they solve problems faster. They are able to gather the information faster and deal with the problem more easily. And it requires less emotions and stress for them to do so. And when we're looking at gifted people and people with a higher level of intelligence, what we're also seeing is higher level of cognitive flexibility Cognitive flexibility being when you can switch between different cognitive processes and ways of thinking and making decisions and functioning, allowing you to make more versatile decisions, allowing you to switch, <laughs> allowing you to switch between you know uh, being logical or being emotional or being introspective or being musical or being artistic or aesthetic or social or using people or resources or money to solve the problem, right? And now the question is, does that mean that intelligent people who have developed all their functions don't have a personality? I wouldn't say so. I'd say that they have their own version of personality, right? We can't necessarily force them into the cognitive categories, saying that, you know, you only have these functions or these processes, and you're only this good, and you're only good in these areas, because that's not the case. There are people that are extremely logical and skilled in maths, but also extremely social and good with people. And there are people that are incredibly talented in art, but also in business. There are people that are incredibly philosophical, but also very much connected to nature and to their surroundings and able to put themselves out there. And of course, there are people that are very much capable of learning languages and pattern recognition, but also very attentive to detail. 
we can't make the de binary distinctions where you know you only have a dominant function and you only use your dominant and you don't use your inferior and you only have these and these functions and they only work in this extent in this order in this way because not everyone operates according to those models some certainly do and most people start out that way so of course once again ask them questions about their childhood and about their development and how they ended up where they are today right what got them from point a to point z right and uh, think about and keep flexibility when you deal with people like Carl Jung would say talk to every single person as their own your own unique human being and individual rather than trying to force them in a specific box or a category those are my thoughts on personality type the 16 personalities and development feel free to let me know your thoughts down below thank you so much for watching and see you all in the next video oh and the most important thing is you can learn something from every single person that you meet. Even if you are older and more experienced, you can learn something from a kid because they might have learned something that you don't know yet and they might have experienced something that you have no experience of yet. Don't look for people that are at your exact level of development or that think the exact same way that you do. Think about what you can learn from each individual that you meet by learning to think about things the way that they think.